The playoffs start Sunday night for the Pelicans, and I have the Thunder perspective on what worries them in this series. Plus, who are the X Factors and Difference Makers? It's a crossover episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go! You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to a crossover edition of Locked On Pelicans, Locked On Thunder. I'm Jake Madison, host of the Locked On Pelicans podcast at Nola Jake on Twitter. He is Rylan Styles at Rylan underscore Styles, host of Locked On Thunder. Rylan, these are fun to do with the Locked On Network here. I'm excited to have you on, and I know I'm excited to be on your show here. We got a one versus eight matchup. See, these are always fun to do. It's exciting to get to talk to you and talk about this series. Yeah, look, this is the type of coverage you can only get as part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, the local host giving you the insight that you want. No one else is coming to you like this, so please subscribe to Locked On Pelicans, Locked On Thunder, follow along on YouTube as well, and become an everydayer, and that means you're listening Monday through Friday. Let us know in the comments down below, are you an everydayer of Locked On Thunder, an everydayer of Locked On Pelicans? And of course, today's crossover episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I've got a competitive side. I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go, the hit mobile twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends, download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. Okay, Rylan, number one seed Oklahoma City Thunder. We, that couldn't have been your expectation going into this season, right? Yeah, I don't think anyone expected the one seed. I think that uh, you were hoping that this Thunder team that made some noise late last year, you know, maybe they can in a tough Western Conference get top six and, and clear the play-in tournament. That would have been a wild success. And then, you know, as, as the preseason got started, you thought, well, maybe uh, as a young team, they'll take the regular season more seriously. Maybe they can model themselves after the Kings and get like a home court advantage in round one. But nobody thought it would be the first seed in the West with 57 wins. No. So so what what, what got them there? What was the driving force behind that? I think that it's it's Shea taking another leap. In the last three years, we've been talking about how, okay, this is probably the best that Shea gets. It was first an all-star caliber player. Then it was an all-NBA guy. Now it's a guy that should win MVP. I don't think he will, but I think that he should win MVP uh, this season. And then with J-Dub, the leap from year one to year two, where he was already an efficient scorer, already a good defender in year one. Now he's an excellent, you know, versatile defender and one of the best shot makers, especially in the fourth quarter uh, that you're going to find, especially for a young player like J-Dub. So you have two now guys that you can turn to to initiate offense in the clutch and whenever you need to go get a bucket to alleviate some pressure off of Shea. And then you just have to mention Chet Holmgren because he actually provides rim protection that the Thunder did not have. I mean, they had Jalen Williams last year, Jay Will taking charges and being on the ground, but having a guy who can erase shots and not just get the raw block numbers, but actually deter you from going inside is big whenever you you know couple that with the amount of perimeter defenders the Thunder have. Lou Dort, one of the best in basketball. Shea is one of the best two-way uh, players in basketball. He's like one of the only superstars that has the motor to play defense at a high clip and be, be an initiator offensively. And we talked about yes. Jada as well. So when, when you look at this team, like how, you know, how do they win? How do they win this series? You know, what makes them kind of go other than Shea just being awesome? Because I agree with you there. Like he's going to get serious MVP consideration this year. Yeah, so, so Shea's obviously going to be the, the main point, but they're one of the best three-point shooting teams, one of the best defending teams in the NBA. I think this series comes down to guys like Isaiah Joe hitting their shots, uh, a rookie like Casey Wallace continuing to knock down corner threes at a massive clip, the big stretch from Lou Dort this season with improved efficiency, like all that stuff is going to matter. And I, I think that when you're looking at the series, one of the biggest questions isn't going to be uh, – inexperience or rebounding, which is what the national media tends to lean on. I think it's going to be, can the Thunder continue to create havoc and, and create turnovers? They, are, they turn you over a ton. In the playoffs, as the game slows down, as the game goes to half court, oftentimes you see those, those sloppy turnovers get cut down. The teams are obviously better once you get to the postseason as well. So can you continue to generate steals, which puts you on the fast break? We see less fast breaks in the playoffs. That's an area the Thunder have dominated I think that they can still do it just because of their sheer length. 
but they're going to have to prove it on Sunday and throughout the postseason. Yeah, you mentioned the experience, right? And is that something you're actually worried about? I think people are looking for a reason to kind of discredit just a young, unproven OKC team. But Shea Gilgis, uh, uh, Shea has been in the playoffs twice before. Like, there's some playoff experience there, maybe not up and down the roster, but your lead guy has, look, he has more playoff games than Brandon Ingram has, right? And I think people consider Brandon Ingram like a more experienced player, and that would be incorrect. Yeah, I think that it's just an easy thing for the national media to lean on and for people who haven't watched this team to lean on. Uh, aside from that, I think that we can't pick and choose which parts of NBA history that we should agree with. Like Historically, yes, young teams have not gone far, but historically, young teams also don't win 57 games in the toughest conference. Historically, young teams are not top five offense, top five defense. Historically, young teams don't have an MVP caliber guy. Historically, top five teams, you know, young teams don't have a coach of the year candidate. Historically, like young teams are not this. So like, they have way more history on their side in terms of like a star driven league that needs to play defense to win. They do both those things. And so like that should matter as well in the postseason equation. I think that with the inexperienced thing, you also look at their, their uncommon maturity in the regular season. They only suffered one three game losing streak. And that was a three game stint where they did not have either one of Shea and J-Dub. And if you take the top two guys off any team, they're not going to be as good as they were before. So one, three, yeah, I've seen, all seen that here a bunch, by the yes. way, <laughs> like that's, that's not anything to, to be concerned about. And, and you look at how they've responded to adversity going back to November 1st against new Orleans on national television, when they blew a 20 point lead in the Paycom center, they struggled to close games in that first month. Since then, they obviously have not as they got to 57 wins in the number one seed in the toughest Western conference we've seen. So we can't spend all preseason and all regular season saying, this Western Conference is going to be impossible. It's going to be decided by one game. Like you're going to have to be really good to get in the playoffs, and then also discredit the team that gets number one and almost wins 60 games in the tough Western Conference. Yeah, when I when I look at this series, like the the, the argument of like, oh, they're inexperienced, so a team can surprise them. It's like, no, th this team, this Thunder team, is really good, and they've seemed to have the Pelicans' number this season. There's a reason they're favored going into this, and most people are picking the Thunder in five or six. And I think when you objectively look at it, that's not an incorrect thing to do. You know, you mentioned the turnovers that they force on defense, and the Pelicans like to do a very similar thing. They want to turn defense into fast break, easy offense because at times they struggle a little bit in the half court. But okay, see really good in the half court too and one of the things I've noticed about them watching them is for you know, a young and experienced team doesn't turn the ball over and that speaks to kind of some of the maturity and level of play right yeah I think that this young team like like you look at Shea it starts at the top every time he's a guy that has high usage and leads the offense he, he turns the ball over like two times a game for as much usage as he has that's in, that's incredible then you trickle down to the guys like J-Dub who when Shea's off the court he's asked to be the 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 you know, kind of Shea light. He doesn't turn the ball over a ton. Like none of these guys are high turnover guys. And so as a team, it cuts down on turnovers. They do not make mistakes, which is impressive considering that their offense is entirely based around cutting and movement. So just a slight miscommunication for a team that if you want to go back to inexperience has not racked up a ton of games together, but they've gelled extremely quickly in that aspect to not turn the ball over a ton. Like it matters. And I think that the Thunder, if it's going to get down to a uh, play style, they have a very adaptive roster, which I don't think gets credit for. As you mentioned, they're fantastic in transition. They're fantastic in the half court. Uh, they can throw out a little bit of a bigger lineup with Jay Will and Chet that's worked really well if they need to. They can also play extremely small with a guy like Kenrich Williams at the five. They can do a multiple uh, different things to, to kind of uh, counter and, and match whatever the opposition is doing. So you've got to feel good about this Thunder team if you're heading into the postseason. So you mentioned some of the depth, and this is the last thing I'll ask you here before we go into the next next bit here on the crossover episode of Locked on Pelicans, Locked on Thunder, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You know, the Pelicans ha have have gotten their wins, you know, 49 wins in the regular season. It's a good team here, but a lot of it has come from their depth and their bench and guys like Jose Alvarado, Najee Marshall were the heroes in that, you know, second playing game win over the Sacramento Kings. How do you feel about the depth for a team like the Thunder? I think that the depth is going to be important for both teams this series and for whoever advances, because a lot of times in the playoffs, we discredit depth, but I think both teams have the depth to, like we mentioned before, match styles. Like the Thunder have guys, have 10 guys that you feel confident can play in the postseason. A guy like Casey Wallace, a guy like Aaron Wiggins, a guy like Kenneth Williams, you can go down the list, but you can deploy them in specific matchups. So, if, so for example, if the Kings were to advance and you were playing this bigger team I, and, and having to do it as a bonus, I think that you would have seen a lot more of Jay Will and Chet playing together than you'll see against New Orleans. For the Pelicans, they have an opportunity to uh, either lean in to playing Valanciunas like they have not done to this point or... 
Matt we'll get into that in a minute because I want to talk more about that because I find that it, it, either way, I don't know how it's going to go yet, but that's that's a talking point for later. Don't you yes, worry. I, I think that that's going to lead off the next segment, but or they can kind of play smaller with which what we saw uh, Nance do on Friday was play exceptionally at the small ball five. They're going to need a small ball counter to OKC. But if you get into the small ball game, the Thunder can play even smaller and better small ball because they've played it more than most teams in the NBA. So I, I think that their depth is key. And on the last point for depth, whenever you go into this series with having the star power, I feel very confident that they're going to have one of or two of Isaiah Joe, Aaron Wiggins, Kenrich Williams have a big shooting night. And if those, if, if one or two of those guys have a big shooting night with Shea star power, you're going to win that game. Yeah, sometimes it's those role players, right? Like that are really going to make the difference in a series. We'll get into kind of some X factors, difference makers. That's going to be coming up. We'll talk a little Pelicans in the next segment as well. That's coming up here next in a crossover episode of Locked on Pelicans, Locked on Thunder. Today's crossover episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. And it's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased in your life. So today I want to say how about I really feel about something. If you're a Pelicans fan, you probably are going to agree with me on this. I kind of hate the replay review rules in the NBA. They make a call, you challenge it, but then they can make another call. And I get that it's technically getting it right, but something just seems weird. And we saw this as the Pelicans took on the Sacramento Kings in that second play in game. So therapy can be different for everyone. And most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams, but it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. And thank you for making it Locked On Thunder, Locked On Pelicans, your first listen today and every day. We got the crossover episode here. He's Rylan Styles, host of Locked On Thunder. I'm Jake Madison, host of Locked On Pelicans, getting you set for the 1 8 matchup. Like you can only get this kind of coverage on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day here. Uh, Rylan, we, which team did you want to see in the first round? If yeah, the Thunder were waiting the... at home and it was the Kings of the Pelicans, which one did you want? It's not going to be very endearing to your audience, but I did want the Pelicans just by the simple no, nature <laughs> of like the Zion injury. Like that, that was very scary. Uh, coming out of Tuesday, Brandon Ingram looked kind of shaky. Uh, CJ McCollum, I think, is a, a pick and roll target that can be played off the floor, especially for the Thunder, who like their initiators are bigger than your average guards. CJ McCollum is smaller than your average guard. And then you have Chet Holmgren laying the screens and picking and popping or picking and rolling that you have to deal with. So for those aspects, it was looking good for, for New Orleans uh, in this in this matchup for Oklahoma City. Yeah, my audience is going to hate you. <laughs> I mean, so, so when you look at this Pelicans team, what worries you? I, I think that what worries me is Brandon Ingram, I think it's going to continue to get better. Like you saw it on Friday. He got better from where he was on Tuesday. He'll be better Sunday than he was on Friday. And as he gets better and becomes that top player that he is, like all you need at that point is a turn back the clock Valanciunas game once, a Trey Murphy massive three game once where he splashes in seven threes and a CJ McCollum, you know, you know, comeback tour. And you've won a couple of games and now all of a sudden it's a series. And now all of a sudden, uh, you know, you're playing in New Orleans, you're on Bourbon Street and you're trying to win a series late. So like, I think that they that the Pelicans have a chance to really make a statement and steal this game if they can get Trey Murphy three games or like a Najee Marshall game. Like all they need is a couple of these role players to really step up. And Trey Murphy is the guy I'm extremely worried about, as you can tell, as a guy who's had like 11 five plus three pointer nights and one 10 three pointer night. That can easily happen Sunday or any other game this series. Yeah, right. Like three point shooting is often the great equalizer on this sort of thing. And the Pelicans have done a really good job of not taking it in large volume, let's say, but making the shots. And they have guys that can get really, really hot. Like CJ McCollum shot in the regular season over 70% from three against the Sacramento Kings. Like that's a guy that's capable of going off. You mentioned Trey Murphy's been able to do it. Herb Jones hasn't been shooting as much recently, but he has been really good from the corners, especially. And while I know OKC does a really good job of making their threes, they're the best three point shooting team in the league in terms of percentage. New Orleans is one of the tops when it comes to kind of contesting out on the three point line. So if you force some of those role players to have a bit of an off night and not, you know, 
I, I don't think it's really going to affect spacing for a guy like Shea who's going to attack and drive. But if you force them to have an off night and New Orleans makes their shots, that's something that can swing a game or two potentially in a series like this. That's the biggest fear for Thunder fans. Number one, Herb Jones is the best defender on Shea. Obviously, Shea's going to be a great scorer, but he's the best defender in the NBA on Shea, which makes him one of the best defenders in the NBA, period, if you can stop Shea. And then you have Brandon Ingram, who's a, a guy that can go get you a bucket. So what you're looking at is a Pelicans team who can defend when they're locked in with their length and size, who can shoot threes whenever the Thunder are, are susceptible to giving up corner threes because of the way that they rotate and collapse in the paint. And then you have a guy like Brandon Ingram who can go kind of knock down shots and you have the rebounding advantage uh, if you can play Valanciunas still in this game. And, you know, you just have the formula to win games. It's going to be the, the shot variant. So you shoot better than the Thunder, then you have the ability to do the rest that you need to do. If you're going to outperform a top seed, you got to shoot better than them, you got to defend them, and you got to have a, a late score. And the, and the Pelicans have all those things. So let me ask you, because it, it relates to the three-point shooting and CJ McCollum in particular. Like, what's the style of defense that the Thunder play? Do they switch? Are they running drop coverage? Are they doing something else? Yeah, the Thunder are going to just switch everything for the most part because that's like th that's their entire goal in this whole rebuild draft process is having people that can switch one through five defensively. Even Chet Holmgren can play on an yeah. island. Like he did that against New Orleans this season as well. He can play on an island because uh, he can play off of you a little bit to give you space to, to not just blow past him. If you do get past him, he has the link to recover. So switching one through five is a big deal. And it also works offensively where their whole goal has been drafting guys who can grab a rebound and go. So you're not looking for the point guard. You're not, you're not stopping your offense. So it's versatility on both ends, especially defensively. The thing where you can capitalize on the Thunder is they are willing to give up corner threes. And Mark's talked about how, you know, look, this is the NBA. Like the scoring is a premium in this modern era. You have to give something up. They're choosing to give up corner threes at times because they're having to collapse in the paint and make up for their size and then rely on their athleticism to spray out to the corners. You get a quick release though. It's tough to spray out in the corners, no matter how athletic you are. And so that can lead to some open corner threes where the Pelicans are really good, but that's going to be the style. It's just switching everything because you look at a guy like Brandon Ingram uh, in terms of just pure size, you like having Dort up under him, and then lengthwise, you like having Shea and Jada. So whoever you want to switch on to Brandon Ingram, like the Thunder are going to be okay with it, and they're going to be willing to just you know go through uh, the process of staying matched up in the pick and roll and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, what you've seen recently is CJ thrives, like a guy like CJ McCollum who can be a big difference maker if he has kind of one of those 30-point games that he can do, and he was playing until these past couple of games really well to end the season. He, he feasts on drop coverage. You sag a big man back off of him, give him a little bit of space in a pick-and-roll situation, and he's just going to shoot right over, and that starts to pull guys out of the paint, which is going to open things up from Brand for Brandon Ingram to get a little bit more aggressive and then drive down. It would be the case for Zion Williamson if he was playing. He will be a evaluated by the way for everyone listening maybe around game five if it gets to that point it's still very unlikely you see him in a series but there is a bit of an outside chance that he could make a return late in this one uh but not something to really count on with that but if the thunder are going to switch everything and that's what the pelicans do they're going to switch absolutely everything here you'll see them do a lot of pre-switching so that they can make sure they get herb jones on shea right off of the bat when a pick comes or a screen comes as well you know it, it could limit cj mccullum and he has in, he's had moments where he basically no shows. So finding the way he's going to play, and we'll talk more about that coming up in the next segment here. You mentioned Chet Holmgren, and I'm really curious your thoughts. And, you know, I'll share mine here too on kind of the, the Jonas Valanciunas, Larry Nance Jr. battle with him and what New Orleans is going to do. Uh, let me put it to you this way. If the Pelicans try and run their offense through JV, if they try and post him up against Chet Holmgren, and look, Chet's skinny, he's not as big as, oh, he's big, he's not as strong, let's say, as Valanciunas is, is that a win for the Thunder? Is that something that concerns you if they try and post him up a lot? Yeah, so I think though with Valanciunas, it goes back to our crossover uh, in the play-in last year. If you want to utilize Valanciunas- That was as like, so long ago. That was so long <laughs> ago. Like, feels like years, man. <laughs> If you want to utilize Valanciunas as this guy who you dumped the ball into, I think that the Thunder would be willing to give that up because Chet's yeah. going to get a couple blocks, even if he gives up buckets. Yeah. He'll get a couple blocks and, and like in the possession. And so 
it's like you're bunting in baseball at that point. You're taking the ball out of McCollum's hands, taking the ball out of Brandon Ingram's hands. You're you're not spraying the ball out to Trey Murphy, who I'm deathly afraid of. You're not letting Herb Jones shoot threes. Like, go ahead and take your twos. We'll rely on SGA. We'll rely on Jada. We'll rely on Isaiah Joe to outscore Valanchunas every day of the week. Because on the other end, if we're going to keep Valanchunas on the floor, he cannot possibly guard Chet Holmgren on the perimeter. He just cannot do it. And so if Josh Giddy, who's played exceptionally well in New Orleans, forces you to guard him, what are you going to do with Valanciunas on the court? No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, right? Like, I, you know, the center position is a problem for New Orleans. And when I was looking ahead to playoff matchups, you wanted a team like the Clippers or even the, the Timberwolves where like the center position isn't really a concern for you. But going into this matchup, like it is, right? Jonas Valanciunas can't defend Chet on the perimeter. If they want to post him up, yeah, he can score a couple of times over Chet, but I don't think he's going to have a crazy efficient game that wins it for you. And if you're doing that, as you said, right, there's no ball movement that just slows the pace down it kills you you're not moving the ball around till you find an open three-point shooter or something like that and that's a way that this team loses right they started to do that against the sacramento kings and it didn't work and once they just kind of used Jonas almost like passively a little bit in the flow and the rhythm of the offense is when his game really came together rather than force feeding him but if he doesn't work then you run with larry nance jr out there who yes can switch on the perimeter and at least defend chet out there but there's a huge size advantage for chet there where he can probably just shoot over him and probably out rebound him and this is an area that i think is a big concern for new orleans so maybe it's just they go play really small you've seen Najee marshall at the five you've seen dyson daniels at the five a little bit too and i wonder if that's something that they just really might try look to look at doing and see if they can just kind of like out athleticism the oklahoma city thunder here but that's easier said than done and i don't know how well that's going to kind of work in theory when it comes to this but I just don't think the answer is going to be running through Jonas Valanciunas. If they double, that's where that's the that's the difference, right? You've seen a couple teams double Jonas Valanciunas, and if teams do that, then the Pelicans can move the ball around, and that's how you beat teams. But there's no way with Chet that you're going to see OKC doubling Jonas Valanciunas down low. Yeah, I don't think that that'll be the case at all. And I think that when you look at this matchup, it goes back to the play in last year whenever they didn't have Chet. And I thought Valanciunas played really well in the first half, but he still could not stay on the floor against J. Will, who's a 6'9", 6'10", center. Uh, and it still was not enough of an advantage for, for him to be on the floor because of how athletic the Thunder are. You're going to have to match their athleticism. And I don't think that Valanciunas can do that because if you're going to play through him, he'll miss a couple bunnies as he did on Friday. And Chet will deter a couple shots. And then you're left with a, a couple of nice lefty hooks down on, on the low block. And, and so be it at that point. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the situation that OKC would would love in this. So let's talk a little more Pelicans in the next segment. I want to get into some of the X factors to players we expect that are going to make a difference at some point in this series. That's coming up here next in a crossover episode of Locked on Thunder, Locked on Pelicans here on both of our channels and the Locked on Podcast Network. I always say your team every day here. Today's episode of Locked on Pelicans, Locked on Thunder is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. So you're feeling low. You're not sure if your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up and say to yourself, it's time to get back in the game and pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies there's so much to do you play on countless dynamic monopoly boards make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball and you get to charge other players for rent on your iconic properties you can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard so get back out there put on your game face download monopoly go now free on the app store and Google Play. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans, Locked On Thunder your first listen today and every day. We are giving you the coverage you're not going to get anywhere else as we get you set for the one versus eight matchup in the Western Conference. It's going to be a fun series. Make sure you are subscribed to your favorite team's podcast and join the community on YouTube as well. He is Ryland Stiles, host of Locked On Thunder. I'm Jake Madison, host of Locked On Pelicans here. So, in this, in this series, right, like the Pelicans are going in with a big disadvantage. If Zion was playing, I think that would definitely be a different thing here. How, how is, um, 
Mark Dagno done a good job of like these kind of quicker turnarounds and game planning for opponents. I think you're seeing uh, some of that in the NBA, whether it's you play two games against a team in a row, or sometimes you play them like one week and then you play them the next. Has he done those kind of quick turnarounds where it's a different game plan going in for the next opponent? Yeah, I think that you see Mark often change it up. I mean, this is a guy who plays 11 to 13 guys a game in the regular season. He is always willing to try something to make adjustments and find the advantage. And it's a reason why this Thunder team, the last two seasons, as they found success, they've been a fantastic third quarter team, a fantastic second half team, and are able to mount these comebacks. This, you know, while having 57 wins, they also have the most double digit point comebacks in games because they're able to, the, the team and the coaching staff is able to see something and quickly on the fly adjust to it, much less when there's two days in between games, as there are little littered throughout this entire series. And on that note, Chet Holmgren with rest has been phenomenal. With two days off this season, he's averaged you know 19 and nine uh, in the in the regular season. So I think that that'll be a big boost as well for a rookie who played all 82 games and is still kind of getting used to the NBA. And so I think that with Mark, you're going to see some tricks up his sleeve. He's been one of the best uh, coaches and challenges. He's, he's been able to mix and match the rotation and, and kind of learn on the fly. And I think they'll do the same thing in this series. Yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of see, uh, you know, especially with like a bunch of breaks, as you mentioned, right? This is really where that kind of chess match with the coaches comes into play here. And we've seen Willie Green do a pretty good job of coming up with the right defensive game plan, offensive game plan, too, and making some adjustments, maybe not as much as Pelicans fans would like, but you've definitely seen that, too. And I'm going to be curious to see as this series progresses, what changes for each and every team here. So I have it listed on, on the side here, X Factors, Difference Makers. I want to lead with this. Shea is second in the league in terms of free throw attempts this season. How much of a factor do you think something like that is going to play into this series? Yeah, I think that would be a big factor. I think that uh, it's it's going to be different, obviously, than what than what we've ever seen before. Uh, he he doesn't have that sort of uh, level of of experience, but I think it's going to be something to monitor very closely. It, it could go good or bad. I'd imagine it's going to go good for the Thunder, but it's still something that you have to see happen. Yeah, New Orleans has done a good job overall because you have guys like Herb Jones and Dyson Daniels there of not fouling some of those players. I know Pelicans fans probably think differently here, but they rank right around the top 10 in terms of like not allowing fouls, not allowing free throws per game and things like that. You know, having Herb Jones and Dyson to throw at Shea basically all game, right? Every minute he's on the court, it's either going to be Herb Jones, you know, just being one of the premier defenders in the NBA, as you mentioned, but you also have Dyson Daniels who has really good length there. And a lot of people think is either a better defender individually than Herb is already or could be too. I think if you can kind of press that point of attack and give him kind of all of that for this series, it might limit some of the foul calls that he gets. But also if you can just press it and force a couple of turnovers, New Orleans definitely needs to do that. Easier said than done because we talked about that earlier in the show here, how for such a young team, they're really good at taking care of the ball. But that's going to be such an interesting matchup to watch, Shea versus Herb versus Dyson, the entirety of every game this series is how I'm assuming it's going to go. Yeah, it'll be a great matchup to watch. I think that it goes back to their very last game that they played with each other, and you and you hit on it. It's going to be the fouls, because in that last matchup, Shea struggled out of the gate a little bit. J-Dub had it going, so the Thunder just changed their rotational pattern. Typically, they play Shea all the first quarter, all the third quarter, and then close the second and fourth quarters with them. But in that game, Shea started slow. Jada was the hot hand, and they knew Herb Jones was one of the best defenders, so they put Shea, they, they took Shea out and let Jada have that first quarter and then staggered him back in with Herb on the bench. And in that same time, Herb kind of gave away a couple of fouls on Isaiah Joe, swiping at the ball at the top of the key and jumping into Lou Dort's jump shot. Uh, well, those are two fouls that come back costly and got him in foul trouble early and kind of kept him there, which in the playoffs, that stuff really matters. And I'm, I'm looking at that too from a Thunder standpoint of rookies in the playoffs, like a guy like Chuck Holmgren, who has done a great job this year of not chasing blocks, but the lights get brighter, the games get more intense, and you and you start to just want to make a play. It, it's not going to come out of just pure like like inexperience in the sense of like not being good enough, but just the the want to go do the right thing and go make the big play for your team can sometimes lead to you being out of position, getting a block and getting a foul put on you uh, and, and really putting yourself in foul trouble. So with Herb Jones and, and the defenders, they're going to have to do a good job of not wasting their fouls, so to say, on the offensive end or on the wrong players. 
Yeah, you, you've seen Herb Jones do that a little bit, right? There's been a couple of just like sloppy fouls where he just swipes at someone who's bringing the ball up the court, right? And it's like, that isn't the time to do that sort of thing. And he's been in foul trouble a little bit recently, but I think you're seeing him realize like, I need to kind of just tighten certain things up. I can't maybe be as aggressive as I want for a steal and forcing a miss is just as good at that point. So then maybe they can still get out and run because similar to the Thunder, they have a ton of guys that can just bring the ball up the court and they want to get out and run. They don't need to look for CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram. Herb Jones is capable of doing it. Trey Murphy is capable of bringing the ball up the court too. Heck, even Jonas Valanciunas does it on occasion. Larry Nance Jr. So I think they play similar-ish styles, I think, at times offensively and defensively, which means this is going to be really intriguing to me and how this one's going to go. But certainly the foul calls and if Shea can get to the line eight, nine, ten times a game, that's going to be a big advantage, I think, for the Oklahoma City Thunder. So New Orleans is really going to need to be sound and solid on that side of the ball. What about a guy like Josh Giddy, who, who I think it was last game in the Smoothie King Center in New Orleans kind of tormented the Pelicans with the open three-point shooting. I think part of their game plan is going to be like, let him shoot, right? Like if Giddy ends up with a couple of 30 point games because he went off from three, he's this season, I think, shooting 33.3%, right? One out of every three. New Orleans is going to be content with that if you're looking at it kind of like process over results. Yeah, Josh Giddy loves to play in New Orleans, loves to play at Pelicans. That's so epic. annoying, man. <laughs> he had 31 points in last year's playing game. Uh, Brandon Ingram mentioned in this post game yesterday that like Josh Giddy just loves playing the Pelicans. Uh, the Pelicans were in the midst of this season turnaround. Like Josh Giddy started the year so awful uh, and, and kind of adapting to this new role. As a 21-year-old, his role changed for the fourth straight season, not only changing countries and teammates. And, and now his role of you went from being the number two guy to the number three guy, and, and to at certain aspects, number four guy with Chet Holmgren being an option to score offensively, and he's had to learn how to play off ball more. But since March 1st, Josh Giddy is averaging 15 points, seven boards, six assists, and 1.2 stocks a game, which includes 54% from the floor, 37% from beyond the arc, and the most important part is 69% at the rim. If you can hit 69% of your shots at the rim with his body and his size, and 40% of your non-corner triples above the break, you're going to be in good shape. That's only been a stretch though since March 1st. Can you continue that? The Pelicans were on the wrong end of a, of a huge three-point night from uh, Josh Giddy. I will say, though, uh, that has not been the only way he's found success. He did have a massive four-plus three-point night in Milwaukee and uh, New Orleans back-to-back. -back. But since then, it's been one three-pointer, two three-pointer, but dominating inside the arc and finding your stride in the mid-range and at the rim. I think that's going to be the key for Josh Giddy. Obviously, if he finds success from three, that's going to be even better for him. But the, the caveat would be, uh, like a game against Dallas you know, on TNT, Dallas had that same mindset of we're going to put the center underneath the rim and just blatantly ignore Josh Giddy. And the Thunder were able to take him out of the game, even though he wasn't playing poorly individually. But as a team, you cannot have that happen. And so they were able to take him out of the game and, and put in guys like Casey Wallace, Aaron Wiggins, uh, Kenrich Williams, and, and, and the list goes on of guys that can put in for him and uh, adapt to that and make you stop playing that way and get you back to you know spacing a five-out offense and kind of counter it. So it's going to be a big deal because if Josh Giddy plays well, the Thunder will, will really be unbeatable in this series. But if he doesn't play well, it's not as though it's gonna it's gonna kind of deter the Thunder in this series at all. Yeah, it'll it'll it would force him to make some adjustments, which I think is at least a good thing, right? And all of a sudden they've got to go to kind of plan B, plan C, whatever it might be from the original game plan with everything. And you know, it, it, I think that New Orleans needs to defend this team kind of similar to what they did with Sacramento, right? Don't let Shea get into the paint. If you can limit that and turn them, look, and I understand that Oklahoma City Thunder can make their threes, but they don't do it on the highest volume in the league. Turn guys into jump shooters, and you just kind of live with it if they get going from three and they beat you that way, right? With the Sacramento Kings, it was don't let De'Aaron Fox get into the paint and start spraying the ball around and kind of break your defense down that way. I think some of the same goes for Shea Gilgis Alexander as well of try and limit him in that, turn him into a jump shooter. And New Orleans has done a very good job with some of that this season. And it might simply come down to these star players, right? What are you going to get from Brandon Ingram? What are you going to get from Shea Gilgis Alexander? It's going to be a fun series, though. You excited? You're coming to New Orleans, too, right, for it? I'll, I'll be there for games three and four. I'm really excited about that. Really excited to see you in person, do some pods, do, do everything. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, we'll do everything here, man. Look, I love it. Everyone wants to come to New Orleans. I never have to leave and I get to see everybody. I was telling you before the show, I've met something like seven hosts in the past like two months or something like that. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you are subscribed to Locked on Thunder. If you're a Thunder fan, Locked on Pelicans. If you're a Pelicans fan on YouTube and wherever get you get your podcast, this is the type of show you can only get on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team, every day. He is Ryland Styles, host of Locked on Thunder, at Ryland underscore Styles. I'm Jake Madison, host of Locked on Pelicans at Nola Jake. We appreciate y'all so much for listening. Enjoy the series. We'll have a lot more content here, maybe another crossover. Who knows, but it's going to be a fun one and we'll see y'all next time.